Hello everyone, Jono here, back again with our third entry into the Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories Challenge Run series. We proved in our last video that we can beat the game with a Sea Serpent Monster deck, despite not having direct access to any of them in our initial starting deck. So let's add another start chip to that board. Reading through your comments, I noticed a lot of requests to do runs with two specific subtypes in the game. Those being the Ritual and the Female subtype. So let's add those to our list. Yes, I will confirm this to you right now. I will at some point attempt to beat this game with Ritual Monsters. No take backs. I am also aware that there are other subtypes in this game, but I'll add them to the list as people start requesting them. Moving along, I saw a bunch of different types suggested to me for this run, but the one that stood out the most, of course, was the Insect type. Tying off the Rex and Weevil duo for this run, so I think it's only fitting that we stick to that one. Insects are an interesting typing for this run. There are a total of 35 insects in this game, with 19 being made available to the player in the starting deck. 10 become available later on to you from opponents, and the last 6 are locked to the Japanese version of the game via a pocket station. Quickly recapping the rules, I want to add an extra condition to this list. We are not allowed to access the pocket station insects until we reach the final 6. And with that being said, here's our starting deck. I have purposely left out Raigeki till later in the run as a self-imposed restriction. Kicking things off, we have our first duel against the Windex Paper Towel. As this is early game, none of the opponents will really give us any trouble, so long as we can summon something over 1800 attack. This will last all the way till at least, probably Pegasus. So for the meantime, we'll speed through these duels and I'll drop some trivia along the way to keep things entertaining. You probably noticed that I just fused a second ago. This is a great time to tell you about a card called Kuagata Alpha. This card is the only insect in this game that can fuse, and is also one of the ritual conditions for Javelin Beetle. Insects fused with Kuagata Alpha will turn into Quagga Hercules, a decently heavy beta early game at 1900 attack points. With our final turn on screen, we attack for game, and we win da -da 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 -da, Air Narmit of Nefariousness. With Simon out of the way, we book it to the dual grounds and face off against Tina. It is highly refreshing <laughs> to play this game again with monsters. The early game Sea Serpent run was an absolute nightmare having to cycle through my cards to get anything useful. I skimmed through the starting deck, so I neglected to explain the equip cards our insects are compatible with. Laser Cannon Armor and Insect Armor with Laser Cannon, yes, those are two different things, are compatible with all our insects. Strangely, Ray's Body Heat, despite being a dinosaur equip card, also works with our Bug Buddies, giving us three universal equip cards outside of Bright Castle and Megamorph. Beast Fangs is also probably the next closest thing to a universal card, but some of the insects don't work with it. Oh look, we won! and we got an Ancient Jar. Thanks, Tina. Moving aside from Tina, we're on to Villager 1. Starting the duel off, hooray, there's no bricks today. Anywho, the first card we'll summon is Giant Scorpion of the Tundra. This is an insect with the third strongest attack that's made available to us in the starting deck. On the trivia side of things, Giant Scorpion of the Tundra, that is such a mouthful, is a counterpart of Nightmare Scorpion. What I mean by counterpart is that the artist changed the card art around, swapped its colors, slapped a new name on it, and called it a day. Unrelated, the spelling of this card in Japanese can be read like the word Sundere, so take that as you will. Anywho, onto the final turn, we attack, and that's game. We win a Skull Servant. Yay. Villager 1 is down, and it's onto the absolute poo known as Villager 2. For those of you who haven't watched the Sea Serpent video, which I highly recommend you do, we ended up wiping to this guy because we consecutively bricked on four hands. But I won't do that again. Anywho, the card I summoned on turn 1 is called Alien Section. This was an OCG card released in Booster Pack 2, and then later released 20 friggin' years later in the Ultimate Predators Speed Duel Starter Deck. Why this card took 20 years and still had enough attention to be reprinted, I'll never know. But that doesn't matter to us right now, because for our purposes we need to win, and win we shall. That's Villager 2 down, and we get an Ugochi. Ugochi? Eh, who knows. Moving to the guy who struggles to pee, it's time for Villager 3. I look at the Pokedex entry for Great Scorpion of Tundra, which states that it's a rare Scarlet Scorpion, despite being a distinctive dark blue in the photo. Classic translation fun right there. As per the usual, each time I see a Kuwagata Alpha, we must fuse, because the game makes me feel that I have an iota of control in determining the outcome of each match if I have a chance to fuse. I'll take it. Feels like I'm actually playing something. Any Hutsu, Electric Boogaloo, for those really unfamiliar with this game, the field spell that is compatible with all insects is Forest, which I'll showcase in a later duel. But for now, we attack for game, and we win a Liquid Beast. 
Speaking of things that make us want to summon our liquid beast, Tina takes us out to the town square where we witness a protest being held with views to eradicate all insects from Egypt. Moving aside to our blondie bro John O, we find out that he's having a hard time beating Seto for his challenge run. I sympathise with you buddy. Oh, fun fact, if you've never done this before, when you exit this scene and go over to the shrine, you witness a cutscene with all the high mages talking about waiting for Master Hessian. I think it's at this point that they were planning to overthrow Egypt. Cool, right? Anywho, we jump down to the duel arena and face off in a duel against Jono. So far, so good. We're keeping the streak going. That's five duels with no bricks. Jono isn't overly threatening as an opponent. Our weakest monster with a single equip card should be more than enough to take him down. Our trivia card for this duel is Killer Needle. It's the second strongest insect available to us in the starting deck, and is also the only card in the TCG till this day that has the word Killer in its name. Heck, they even left it like that in multiple seasons of the anime dub. That's pretty killer, isn't it? Eh, yeah, bad puns aside. We attack with Killer Needle, and we attack with Alien Section, and we attack with Quagga Hercules, and that's game, and we win a little Chimera. Busting into the room is Seto. He and his exterminator buddies have come to expect the door grounds for traces of buggy behavior. Seto's strongest card in his deck is Guy the Fierce Knight. So long as our insects are above 2300 attack, we won't have an issue. Our insects, by the way, almost always have the default Guardian Star of Jupiter. That's that weird number four squiggly thingy. Jupiters are strong against Saturn types and weak against Mars. Think of it like a sort of, you know, grass, fire, and whatever the heck Saturn is typing. It's going to be handy for us to remember that because Meteor Black Dragon is a Mars type and that's going to be very problematic against us. Anywho, we attack for game and we win a da -da 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 -da, a Cherubian Fire Knight. And that's Seto down. Defeating Seto lets us roam freely outside. We start pondering on whether we should let loose a plague of insects, just for shits and giggles, when we really get interrupted by this bleach stained tea towel who sends us to our room. Percolating on his life choices, commotion occurs and the palace is invaded by Jafar's pest control, who are actively bug spraying the castle with his Millennium Mortine. The generic palace female rouses us out of our room before getting detained by Seto and friends for having head lice. We escape outside to protect our incense from further harm where we're confronted once more by Seto who demands to know who set off an insect plague. It was the blue tower, I swear, look, he even brought us an ant farm to prove it. Smoke bombing away, we bump into the chief of animal control Jafar, who challenges us to a duel. We're not going to bother trying to defeat him, since we saw what happened in our Sea Serpent run. The game will keep looping the duel until we lose. In a complete act of hypocrisy, he also summons his own perfectly ultimate Great Moth, which proves that he's either cheating or has his own pocket station stashed at home, and is also very counterproductive for someone in pest control. What a cheeky bugger. Anywho, we surrender, and the game progresses. Having been defeated, the blue Hamburglar grabs Jafar and tries to shove the Millennium Ant Farm up his butt. Unfortunately, it didn't fit and it broke. Being banished to the staircase dimension, we bid farewell to this moist paper towelette, for the time being. We cut back to the present, and Kaiba seems to be holding a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Announcer Camo has dyed the front of his mohawk blonde in anticipation for the upcoming Barbie movie. I think he's still set in his mind that he has a chance of being cast as Ken. Oh well, saving our game, finally, we're on to the prelims. Our first opponent in the prelims is our starter deck buddy Rex. The prelim matches will start to get a bit difficult for us. We can comfortably semi-brick a hand and still end up with a monster that's about 1500 to 2000 attack points, but that won't be enough when our next opponents start dealing 2000 plus. For those of you with keen vision in the audience, you may have noticed that I have a Rageki in my hand. I added that into my deck after I got out of the Pharaoh's Palace. I think I'll start adding one copy of that card as we progress through each sort of area of the game. So I think I'll add a second copy when we get to the Mages, and a third as we get to the final six. Who knows? I'm starting to miss saying Raigeki for the win, so I might end up putting that back in sooner. Speaking of sayings, anywho, we're on our final turn. We put down an Insect Soldiers of the Sky, which is useless, and we attack for game. That's Rex down, and we win a little D. Fitting. Getting back to the main menu, we decide to not save our game. Let's start a tab. Take a shot every time Jono doesn't save his game. Finish your drink when he eventually wipes out and has to do this entire thing all over again. I'm kidding, please. Do not drink, or if you do drink, drink responsibly, etc, etc. I don't want to get demonetized for this. Now getting back to the duel, you may have noticed we're having a bit of trouble against Weevil. I think I may have partially bricked my hand for the first time ever in this run. Weevil on the other hand seems to be cheating by summoning monsters that aren't insects. So I throw down a forest just to protect myself with an extra 500 attack points in case anything dicey comes on the field. Speaking of, 
We finally get a cool gutter alpha and we can make our Quago Hercules. Miss that bloke, seriously. And you know what I don't miss? Attacking a defense position monster and losing. Fun stuff there. Frickin' planes, I swear this area. Anywho, back to the card game. And I realize that I've mistakenly left Insect Soldiers of the Sky as a Saturn, which is not good. Saturn is weak to Jupiter, and almost all of Weevil's monsters will be Jupiter. Now, there is a way to change it after you summon a monster on the field, but I had completely forgotten about it because you know what? That's just me. That's how I am. If you attempt a fusion with a card that is not compatible with a monster, when it resolves, you're able to change its Guardian Star before putting it back on the field. This is not needed for us. We're on our final turn, and we attack for game. And we win da -da 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 -da, a Trial of Nightmares. That's literally what this challenge run is. That's Weevil down, and we skip saving our game, as per the usual. Mai is laughably pathetic as an opponent for us this run. We ended up opening strong with 4 equipped cards, boosting Intersect Soldier of the Sky's attack to 3000. There isn't much to say, moving on. We end up steamrolling everything she has, so I'll enlighten you with some more tips and trivia. In episode 64 of the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, Weevil Underwood used Insect Soldiers of the Sky against his duel against Joey. In that duel, Joey used Magical Arm Shield to redirect an attack from Weevil's Insect Queen back to Insect Soldiers of the Sky, destroying it. So it didn't have that long of a run. It later reappeared again in episode 129 of the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX anime. It came up as a duel monster spirit. With my trivia on point, we attacked for game and we won a Winged Dragon number 2. Say bye to Mai. On to saving our game. Not. Our next schmuck in this muck is Bandit Keith. Not expecting much of a challenge from him, so let's see how things go. I'd like to present to you the best insect in the game, Spike Snail. This has got to be one of the funniest designs I've ever seen. Giving us the same vibes of a fish-headed chicken, Spike Snail is a counterpart of Mechanical Snail. By counterpart, I mean a new pose plus a recolor. It was also the first non-Earth Insect card in the OCG, arriving in Booster Box 1, and it was never reprinted again due to its sheer awesomeness. Clearly, they peak with this card, and I don't think it was fit to tamper with perfection. Moving along, as mentioned before, the opponent's cards are creeping past the 1800 attack mark, which isn't good for us as we're basically relying on Quagga Hercules to carry us through the entire prelims. There's also a bit of a misalignment with our equipped cards, with Beast Fang being not compatible with the bulk of our flying insects. I guess we'll resolve that as we start getting better cards. But anywho, attacking one with Quagga Hercules and attacking the second with Killer Needle, that's game, and we get a Cyber Commander. That's Bandit Keith down. And we're gonna save? Yes we are, because I'm not sitting through that again because it's time for a cutscene. Joey begins bragging to us that he hasn't been eliminated yet, when our conversation gets interrupted by Shardy. Shardy tells us that we need to have a chat with a big man in a little box, but mandates that we first must touch him before doing so. Meeting with our past self, without any words being spoken, the voices in our head tell us that we need to steal some jewelry. Being fluent in Bankstown, we understand the assignment and return to the present. Admiring our free cardboard, we notice a nice shiny key on Shardy's neck, and I think we found our first target. Sorry mate, we must obey the voices. Recalling our humiliating loss to Shardy in the Sea Serpent playthrough, I am absolutely ecstatic to see that I have a monster in my hand. The rest of the duel from this point on will be a breeze, because for some reason, Shardy has locked himself into summoning Hoshi Ningen, a weak as hell fairy monster. Ugh, I'm not looking forward to that run when I get around to it. Anywho, I believe the AI behavior has been explained in the comments of my last video. In defeating the first monster summoned by the AI, they will only summon cards equal to or lower in power than the destroyed card. I have not tested this enough to verify it, but I'll take the explanation. Just like I'll take this win. And I'll take this card. And I'll take his stuff. Take this brief pause, and lastly, I'll take this moment to not save my game. Up next is Yami Bakura, and I have completely blanked out as to what resides in his deck, so expect to see a bunch of misplays from my end. Fortunately, we have a fantastic hand, having both a Kuwagata A and an Inset Monster. Boost the bad boy up to 2400 attack points, and it's a shame that Follow Wind doesn't work on him. Which I think is absolute bullcrap, because I'm certain underneath all that he has wings, because that's what Follow Wind does, works on winged monsters. Anywho, Bakura is continuing his round of attrition. I don't know why I didn't just use the Raigeki in my hand. Something in my brain just wasn't connected to my fingers, and I made this duel longer than it intended to be. So, you know, sorry about that. Bakura starts fusing some monsters on us. I didn't realize that one of Metal Dragon's secondary types is Pyro, which is why he's able to use it to fuse into Crimson Sunbird. I think lore-wise, it is mentioned as a fire-breathing dragon, so I guess that makes sense. When making a single type deck, I've been purposely ignoring the secondary typings as I feel it bends the rules a little too much. They aren't obviously known to the player unless you've taken the time to fuse everything in this game together. 
I plan to keep that rule that way, unless the Pyro run forces us into it. Because that run is going to be a punish. And speaking of, we attack for game, and we get... a Buku. That's neat. Stealing his necklace like the voices told us to, we make our way back to the card shop, and this time we actually save our game. I wasn't going to risk going back to Rex Raptor in case I screwed up anything. On to the guy with a funny eye, it's Pegasus. We drop a forest in turn 1 to have some extra attack power for any Bakuri boxes he may summon. But I don't really think we're going to need it. One of my hands had the card Giant Flea in it, so let's drop some trivia on that. This card first made an appearance in the Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist manga, aka Duelist Kingdom. In the duel between Yu-Gi and Weevil, Weevil summons this card against Yu-Gi. Due to either an art or translation error, both Giant Flea and Big Insect had their names and card artworks switched around, so the manga version had 1200 attack points and 1500 defense points, instead of the other way around. With my timing on point, we attack a monster, and we attack for game, and that's Pegasus down, and we got a Larvus. Let's steal this bloke's eye. We must obey the voices. Up ahead, we have Naomi Ishizu. Yes, that's what she's called in the Japanese version of the game, for those of you that didn't know. Also, Naomi backwards is I moan. No relevance there, just wanted to throw that out there. Our first hand isn't too spectacular, but I'm not overly worried. I don't think there isn't much she can throw against- Oh, and there we go, there's a twin head. Right, so we are up shit creek without a paddle. So I decided to change the landscape to a forest, giving me some much needed attack point boosts against her. Thankfully, I have a Kuwagata Alpha and at least enough equipped cards to hit over a twin head to put that beast away. I do still need to stay on my toes, however, because she does have the field spell Umi in her deck, and she also has a Black Skull Dragon. But I doubt she'll summon it at this point given the AI mechanics right now. In a move I haven't actually seen before, she uses Soul of the Pure to give her back about 2000 life points. Casually, I never really use Soul of the Pure or Dian Keto, but they're pretty handy cards against the final six if you find yourself struggling. Anywho, with 600 life points left and not enough time for a trivia, we attack for game and Ashizu drops us... a Psychic Kappa. We also steal her necklace, not because of the voices, I just think it's neat. On to our last duel of the finals, and we're facing off against Kaiba. I find it interesting this game doesn't give us a duel against Joey, despite him being in the finals with us. I wonder who actually defeats him. Plot holes aside, we set up a forest just in case Kaiba summons a blue eyes white dragon on us. Thankfully, it's only a twin head. And fortunately we have enough equipped cards to hit over it. I have to be particular in using Insect Soldiers of the Sky because it's the only card in my hand that would work with Follow Wind. Fusing a Kuwagata Alpha with a Goki Boar, we make a Kuwaga Hercules. Bit of fun fact for ya. The card artwork for Giant Ballpark has Kuwagata Alpha throwing Goki Boar. I'll put it up on screen for you guys to see. If you look closely at the card artwork, you can see Basic Insect and Kumutoko as the outfielders. It's basically our entire deck. I love that card. Didn't even know it existed till I did this video. Anywho, we attack for game, Kaiba goes down, we get a Wicked Worm Beast, and we take his Polished Rod. Having successfully stolen all the jewelry from the tournament, we launder it across the mansions to cover our tracks, and we let Prince Weevil take it from here. We say our last goodbyes to this Alizé tea towel, and warp ourselves back in time to a very insectless past. Navigating our way to the King's Valley, we met up with Blue Shardy, or as the game likes to call him, Sidin. Sidin and his family inform us that they have been guarding this place for many generations, yet have absolutely no idea where anything is. This accurately reflects my workplace. Attempting to return back to our primary residence, we find that the place has been absolutely destroyed, and worse, fumigated. Challenging the mage soldier, he ends up summoning the strongest monster available in his deck, that being Jirai Gumo, a card we'll be looking to obtain for ourselves very soon. I'm a bit light on the quip cards, especially with this last hand that I just drew, but thankfully there are two raised body heats, which is just enough to have 2,400 defense points to hit over Jirai Gumo. Although it will power up Jirai Gumo, we end up putting down a precautionary forest. One, to attack for more damage when you have a clean sleep at his life points, but two, in case he decides to summon something like a La Jin and power it with an equip card, we have more than enough to hit over it just for some safety. Oh hey look, haven't seen that in a while, we have a Raigeki in our hand. Fun fact about Raigeki, or specific to this game, you can fuse into it. If you take an Electro Whip and a Metal Morph, they fuse together to make Raigeki. I doubt you'd actually be in that much of a pinch that you need to fuse into a Raigeki, but for those of you that don't have two memory cards, that might be one way out of it. With Major Boy down, we ransack the room, steal a map, make our way back to the King's Valley, and slap a map in this guy's face. After Sadin does his job and takes us where we want to go, we find ourselves heartbroken. The anti-insect protest we witnessed at the start of the game was successful, and all bugs have been outlawed from Egypt. So says the random golden wall. 
Seto swaggers up to us and smugly declares that Haishan has installed insect protection barriers all throughout Egypt, each of those guarded by the franchisees of the notorious Jim's Pest Control. Truly formidable opponents. There's only one thing left to do. We need to defeat all of the mages, take down each of the shrines, and restore the insect rule over Egypt. Navigating back to the metropolis, we enter the old door grounds and initiate a conversation with Jono too. Don't know what he was doing down here. I don't know why he wasn't just hanging out with everyone else. But details aside, we meet up with Jono and Tina and we challenge them to a duel. Up first on the chopping block is Jono too. We draw a bit of a dud hand on turn one, but thankfully we aren't punished too much in return as Jono ends up summoning his guild to the D Knight at 1850 attack points instead of his red eyes black dragon. For this duel, I recommend sending your insects to a type other than Jupiter as their guardian star, as a fair few of Jono's ace monsters are defaulted to a Mars guardian star. You notice how I said recommend. I forgot to take my own advice and I copped a few unnecessary monster losses as a result of that. Finally remembering how guardian stars work, I beef up an insect soldier of the sky and set him to a Saturn. That won't be affected by flank Cerberus' Mars type, so we take it out and we go on with the duel. Thankfully, I draw into a Quagga Hercules and beef him up with the Beast Fangs. This should be more than enough to take out Jono. Thus far, our deck seems strong enough to take out opponents of this level, so I don't think we're due for grinding anytime soon, but I'll wait and see till the mages humble me. Attacking for game, Jono goes down, and we win, da -da 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 -da, a secretary in secrets. With Jono out of the way, let's switch across to Tina. Tina is a relatively easy opponent, so there's not really much I can say about this duel. I draw a pretty good hand, and she really doesn't have anything that can hit over my boosted Quagga Hercules, so I'll go across to some card trivia. This time will be some equip card trivia, particularly the insect armor with laser cannon equip card. This card was released in the OCG back in 1999 as a promotional card for Yu-Gi-Oh! Dark Duel Stories. It wasn't reprinted in the TCG till about 14 years later in the Number Hunters Booster Pack. Those are two generational seasons going past Yu-Gi-Oh! GX and Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds. Getting back to the duel, we attack for game with Quagga Hercules, Taya goes down, and we win an Arm Ninja. With our two buddies taken care of in the duel grounds, I think it's time we save our game, because I'm not making a repeat of last time. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, go watch the Sea Serpent run. It is time to take on the mages and restore order back to Egypt. By restore order, I mean plague it with insects. For a field spell advantage, I'm going to be targeting the forest mage first. I have also forgotten that this field spell advantage also applies to the forest mage, so we'll see how well this goes. Now the low forest mage unfortunately doesn't drop any useful insect types to us. All the ones that are available in his drop table at both POW and TECH all drop from the initial starting deck. I am noticing throughout this duel that I'm having a bit of trouble with my equip cards. There's a lot of insects that I have in my deck that are not compatible with Follow Wind. So I think I might be due for either a monster shakeup or an equip card shakeup. We'll see how we go. Oh hey! Raigeki for the win. We haven't done that in a while. We attack for game and we get a tentacle plant. With low mage down, we feed him to the man eater bugs and make our way to the high mage. Facing off against the high mage of toilet paper and Obesius, he is going to be surprisingly difficult. His top 5 monsters in his deck, boosted by Forest, are all going to be hitting me for 3000 to 4000 attack. His main offense is the Great Moth Line and Javelin Beetle, the insects that we do not have access to at this stage. I wish I could say that I beat him first try, but I didn't. I lost to his Javelin Beetle in Duel 1 and wiped to him in Duel 2 against his perfectly ultimate Great Moth. Third time's a charm, hopefully. We draw a dead hand on turn 1. At this stage, our starting hand needs to have a Kuwagata Alpha in order to stand up to the High Mages, and maybe one or two equip cards just for safety. Unfortunately, we don't get that, and he starts to punish us with a Javelin Beetle. Things are not looking good, and this is starting to look like a repeat of the last two duels. Thankfully, we get enough equip cards on turn two to boost up our Giant Flea so that it hits over his Kabu Terramon without too much trouble. At this point, it should be tit for tat. I'd summon something weak and use it to attack when I get the chance, then have it destroyed when the turn switch and attack again over the monster that he used to destroy me. Rinse and repeat. What I didn't anticipate however was him boosting his flame Cerberus which was face down. This is a problem, but thankfully I draw the right equip cards next turn for Killer Needle to take over this duel. Oof, I think I'm speaking a bit faster than the video here, my bad. And apologies in advance, I think I'm starting to lose my voice, so you may hear me croak here and there. I think at this point, now that we've reached the Mages, I can start including more Raigeki in my deck. I think I'm still at 1 from the World Tournament. I wanted to challenge myself and see how much of a crutch it actually was for me. It wasn't that big of one. It does speed up the duels, so I think for future runs, I'll just continue putting 3 Raigeki in. But I want to have a genuine shot at it first. Speaking of, we defeat the Toilet Paper Mage, 
and we sick our bugs on him. Get him, guys. And we steal his Millennium Key in the process. After the dismal attempt we had against the Forest Mage, I think we need to start farming for our new insect cards. This is where our good old buddy and pal Meadow Mage comes in. The Metal Mage, Metal Mage, Meadow Mage, has a chance of dropping Quagga Hercules on defeat, but only at a 1% drop rate. Those are the same odds as Meteor Black Dragon and Skull Knight. Put it this way, you are twice as likely to have him drop a Dark Magician than you are to have him drop any of those cards. But hey, those aren't the worst odds I've dealt with. For the sake of this duel as well, I've purposely tried to set my Guardian Star to anything other than Jupiter. Given that this is a meadow field, all the strong Mars Guardian Star monsters would typically be boosted by this, since they're typically fire. But I think I was just being overly cautious, because the only three Mars types he has in his deck are Garuzi, Flame Swordsman, and Airmail. As for this duel, it's starting to take a while. I'm not drawing strong enough monsters to pair with my equip cards, but that's not a worry. Meadow Mage does not have any destruction cards in his deck other than Warrior Elimination, which ironically destroys both his and my Warrior cards if we had any. Nope, it's going to be a bit of a battle of attrition. We're going to summon something, let him attack over it, and then attack it again, rinse repeat. Same strategy as the Forest Mage. But no chance, it's Raigeki for the win, and it's Quagga Hercules with a steel chair, and we win a White Dolphin. Man a bug, do your thing friggin om nom nom for the win. Speaking of om noms, we're up against Kapura, and it's gonna take double the man eater bugs to eat this big boy. Now against Kapura, we need to watch out for his Gate Guardian and Black Skull Dragon, as well as his guy the Dragon Champion if he decides to summon that. Both Gate Guardian and Black Skull Dragon are defaulted to a Moon Guardian Star. The good thing for us is Quagga Hercules' second Guardian Star is Sun, which is super effective against the Moons. This means we'll only need two equip cards on him instead of three, saving us some resources in the process just as soon as we find a way to hit over Wall Shadow. It's a bit annoying when they do that. But oh well. Raigeki in our hand, we're going to use it. Take these out and attack with both Quagga Herculi. Herculi? Herculeses? Eh, not a linguist. We change ourselves to Forest for absolutely no reason, and then attack for game. And that's Kapura down. And we get Saggy the Dark Clown. Speaking of things that are saggy, we sick our insects on Kapura and steal his Millennium Eye. And that's the Meta Shrine down. Running back to Free Duel off screen, I managed to win a Quagga Hercules off Low Meta Mage, and in the process acquired enough star chips to redeem a Dry Gumo out of the card password screen. I forgot to record footage of this, but I also got a Metal Morph off Bandit Keith. Alright, this is what version 2 of our deck looks like, but don't get used to it. We're going to replace a few of these cards after we get through Seto 2. Getting back to the Egyptian Metropolis, we make our way to the Duel Grounds to initiate the storyline for Seto 2. As per canon events, we encounter Maze Face, who we ended up wiping to in our Sea Serpent run. I still can't get his creepy face out of my head. The Guardian Stars that the Labyrinth Mage spams are both Pluto and Neptune, so setting up a Dry Gumo to Uranus till we power him up is a must. Thus far, this duel has been more defensive than offensive. Labyrinth Mage typically spams Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, but in this scenario, he's been using War Shadow instead. Don't know why, probably an RNG thing. That aside, we're fusing to another Quagga Hercules and start chipping away for some decent damage against his life points. Lo and behold, as if this guy was listening to us, he summons a Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon and starts picking away at my monsters. My mathematics skills have also deteriorated since I sacrificed my Dragumo unnecessarily. Who knew that 2700 is less than 2800? Anywho, progressing with a duel, he summons a nasty sewage in, but we have more than enough attack power with Dragumo to start taking him out. We attack the game and Old Mate drops us a Phantom Ghost. We eat this bloke and progress with the story. We right, right, left, right our way through this maze until we encounter both Haishin and Seto and his anti-insect control regime. Armed with a Millennium Mortine, he shoots off a seedy smile from Seto, hoping to intimidate us into surrender. That doesn't work, so we throw down against Seto 2 in a card game. Seto 2 can be a bit of a problem if you draw a weak hand. As you noticed, he has the ability to summon a gank guardian against you, but that's not all. He has a media Black Dragon in his deck, alongside a bunch of other powerful 3000 plus attack beat sticks. There's no strict recommendation as to what Guardian Star you should be using for this duel. The majority of the heavy hitters are either a Sun or a Moon, with the exception of media Black Dragon out of Mars, so I guess you might want to avoid Jupiter, but I wouldn't get too hung up about it. Putting down a safety forest, we beef ourselves up just that little bit more in case he decides to summon back another Gate Guardian. I still haven't fully tested that theory around the attack power caps when you defeat their first monster, so I'm going to have to rely on you guys in the comments to explain it a bit further to me, because I wasn't familiar with it, but hey, if that's a thing, that will make things a heck of a lot easier. Getting down to our final turn, 
We tag out his Media Dragon, attack with Jiraikumo, and one last attack with Quagga Hercules. That's Seto 2 down, and we steal a statue of Easter Island. Don't know how we fit that in our pocket. Before we start on the rest of the mages, we have some more card farming to do. Labyrinth Mage drops us a Dungeon Worm, albeit at a horrendous 0.1% drop rate. As I lost my Bandit Keith footage, I forgot that he also dropped me a Hunts the Spider. Both mentioned drops are available at any B, C or D rank. And without further ado, here's version 3 of our deck. The weaker monsters have been swapped out, and Dark Energy has been added to our quick card list, since it works with our stronger spiders in the deck. Upwards and onwards to the Desert Mage. Our Insects are a great matchup against the Desert Field, as most of the opponent's cards will be Uranus Guardian Star, which is weak to Jupiter. As we don't draw that good of a hand, I set down an Equip card to prep us up for turn 2. I still kept a Kuwagata Alpha in my deck given that I have a Hunter Spider, but its uses are starting to get a bit limited given that we already have a Quagga Hercules in our deck list. Depending on how we go, we might drop him from the deck when we start farming the Aztec Equip cards. But for now, he stays, because I like him, and he's been carrying us throughout this run. Getting our souls to the final turn, he's only got 1200 life points left. We use a Raigeki for the win, and we attack for game. Da -da 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 we win a Graveyard Hand of Invitation, and Desert Mage has been eaten by our insects. The Egyptian Tuxedo Mask is up next. Our starting hand is a Brick, so we lay down a Field Spell for safety, hoping to bait him into using one of his own. Unfortunately, the AI is smart enough not to take the bait. However, the strongest card in his deck is only Azar, so I'm not too worried unless we Brick again. By the looks of things, I don't think we're going to Brick for the rest of this duel. That Jirai Gumo is an absolute beast. Getting to our last few turns, I want to show off something to you all. I doubt I'll be able to pull this off again this run, so I'm going to give it the best shot I have right now. There is a way for us to pull off two attacks with a single monster. Watch closely. After clearing the field, we attack once with a Jirai Gumo, then we fuse him with the Metal Morph we had set previously, and attack him again as our newly formed Launcher Spider. That's Martis down, and we get a King Fog. Feeding him to the Man Eater Bugs, we steal his Millennium Scales, and it's on to the next mage. Swimming across the ocean, we encounter the Ocean Mage. During our first turn, we fail to draw any equipped cards, which is basically a brick for us. Our next turns against the mage aren't any better. I forgot that the Ocean Mage still carries some decent attackers, being Sea King Dragon and Aqua Dragon. Not wanting to take chances, I dark hold the monsters away. How's that for a toilet flush? Anywho, Magey Boy isn't too happy, so he fuses into a Twin-Headed Thudden Dragon. This is worse than what he had out on the field before, and I don't really have anything in my hand to stop it. I still can't math good either, as I thought that my Jirai Gurma with one equip card stood a chance against his twin head. It does not. As you can see here. It is at this moment that I genuinely felt like resetting. But I persevered just in case I pull off a miracle. And oh my god, that's a miracle if I ever saw one. Seriously, 50 life points and a busted Jirai Gurmo. I'm not taking chances. We need to start attacking this guy and attacking him fast. I am very, very thankful that he does not have any direct attack damage cards. I'm also sweating at this point as I haven't saved my game since Tina 2, meaning I'd have to do the whole thing from Seto 2 onwards if I screw up. Thankfully, I think we managed to attack him for game with a Dungeon Worm, and geez, that was a bigger ordeal than it needed to be. Feed him to the bugs. On to the second last High Mage, we face off against Sekmenton. Drawing an unfortunately dud of a hand, we ended up using a forest to bait a response from him to change the field spell back. But, it doesn't work. Not to worry, it gives us more turns to set up our Jirai Gumo. The rest of this duel ends up being a cakewalk. There isn't much to say. We power up a second monster and start chipping away at his life points. Look at that, we even have a Raigeki for the third turn to wipe him out once and for all. Attacking once with Jirai Gumo and a second time with Quagga Hercules, Getting to the last turn, it's Raigeki for the win, and we attack with Jirai Gumo and Quagga Hercules. That's Sekmenton down, and we get an Umi. Feed this golden dude to the bugs and let's steal his necklace. Making our way across the mountains, we encounter the Nathan Cleary Mage. He's a footy player from the Penrith Panthers, for those of you wondering. I apologise to the Penrith fans for pronouncing your team's name with a TH instead of an F. I'm sorry about that. Anywho, jumping back to the duel, there isn't much to say. The strongest monster in his deck is a Black Dragon Jungle King, so let's hit up some card trivia. What better card than Jirai Gumo? This card was a trap card when it first appeared in the manga and anime, but it became an effect monster when it got printed in the TCG. They did end up making a trap card called Prey of Jirai Gumo as an homage to its trap origins. I'll see if I can get an image of that on screen. There we go. Just to flex extra on our opponent, I ended up pulling off the Jirai Gumo and launch a spider last turn kill. I think this will definitely be the last time I'll be able to do it. 
I think Metal Morph might be one of the cards that ends up dropping from my deck. Anywho, obtaining a Key Mace and let's feed him and his Jonalus Chin to the Bugs. The lucky last mage on this run is a Tenza. We need to try change the field to have an easier time against this guy. Else, we need to prepare for a boosted Black Skull Dragon and a Twin Headed Thunder Dragon. It's handy that both Jirai Gurmo and Dungeon Worm have Uranus types. Before getting to the final 6, the majority of opponents will try to spam either a Twin Headed Thunder Dragon or the Gate Guardian pieces, which are mostly Pluto. Whereas the final 6 are all usually set up as Sun or a Moon. I'm not sure if I've mentioned that before, so I apologise if I've repeated myself. As we seem to be doing a good job against this guy, I'll hit you up with some card trivia for Dungeon Worm. The card text for Dungeon Worm says that it's hidden under the floors of a labyrinth. It swallows any who pass above. Alluding that this Dungeon Worm lives inside the labyrinth wall. I could be clutching at straws for that one, but a lot of the wikis seem to be saying the same thing. As for what sort of creature Dungeon Worm is, it's based off a Mongolian Death Worm. Google image it. Creepy, but fairly accurate. We're now onto our last two turns against the mage. We attack his Sangro Thunder and attack him directly with Jirai Gumo. He hasn't got much to summon against us, so it's Raigeki for the win, and we attack for game. Da -da 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 we win a Feral Imp. Time to eat, and let's steal his jewelry. We have successfully consumed all the shrines with our Insect Plague. Hooray for threatening the natural order of Egypt. Now before we go and challenge the final six, I've done enough runs to know that our current deck would not be able to survive Haishin and Seto 3. I'd place it on equal power to our dinosaur deck. As such, we'll need to do some S-Tech farming. Rehashing the same formula as our last videos, we'll need to obtain a few trap cards to help us S-Tech opponents, if we don't go down the route of decking them out. Defeating Pegasus nabs us a Bright Castle and a Megamorph. Defeating Mountain Mage grants us a Dianketo, and Kapura drops us a Crush card. And this is version 4 of our deck for challenging the final 6. Now let's get back to the game. Entering the Vast Shrine, Seto opens the door for us and we must now select our difficulty. The images on screen are self-explanatory. Easy mode grants me access to all the pocket station monsters, while hard mode does not. For maximum headache, I will be playing on hard mode. This means I will not have access to cards like Great Moth and Javelin Beetle. Sebek is up first and he should be a pushover. You simply need to summon a monster over 3100 attack points to deal with his Zoa. Having grinded already for Bright Castles and Megamorphs, I'm expected to have a clean run all the way up until Seto 3. Both Sebek and Neku are beatable even without those cards, so our version 3 deck would have been more than enough to stand up to them. Now I apologise in advance for the background noise, my birds are not shutting up today, so you're just going to have to hear them in the background every so often. Getting to our last turn, we attack his face stands with our Jirai Gumo, and we watch as Sebek struggles in vain. It's Raigeki for the win, and we attack for game. We win, da 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 da, we don't care. It's feeding time. Next up is Neku. Like Sebek, we simply need to summon a monster that's stronger than 3150 attack points. The reason why it's 3150 is because we need to hit over his Skull Knight. We had a strong start in the first turn. We easily get Jirai Gomo up to 3200 attack points and start attacking his life points. On an unrelated note, I wonder if they ever made the full artwork for all the players in this game. I reckon it would look pretty cool. Honestly, at this point, I'd settle for a face reveal of Duel Master K. With all things aside, Neku goes down and we win da -da 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 -da, a turtle tiger. Let's eat this bird. On to Haishin's pest control. For this bad boy, we need to make a monster that can hit over his gate guardian at 3750 attack points. We also need to be cautious to not leave any of our monsters as a Jupiter guardian star, else we have a higher chance of baiting out his media black dragon which hits you as a Mars. Strangely, for Haishin's second deck, he's dropped his perfectly ultimate Great Moth and his Cosmo Queen, but he compensates for this by lowering the percentage that he will draw a weaker monster, so take that as you will. Aside from that, we attack the game with Dungeon Worm, and that's Haishin 2 down, and we get Wood Remains. Haishin scurries away before we get a chance to feed him to the bugs, and Seto claims the Millennium Mortine for himself. Proceeding ahead to the anti-bug pentagram in the sky, Seto consults the wall who tells him to obliterate all insects once and for all by releasing an outbreak of Cordyceps. Not wanting to partake in biological warfare, we challenge him to a duel. With all the wins we've been getting, I'm concerned that I've marked the hard route a bit too harshly. When dueling Seto 3, the hope is for him to summon a Gate Guardian. Throwing out an unboosted monster, sometimes, will get the AI to summon something weaker, so long as it can defeat it. Don't quote me on that logic, it's highly untested. Anywho, getting back to the duel, I seem to be struggling in getting a good hand against this guy. I'm just 50 attack points short from hitting over his Gate Guardian with Jirai Gumo, which is a bit of a problem. 
Unfortunately, with this being the final turn, I think you can tell what happens. I ended up losing to Seto 3. Let's chalk up one loss on the board to this guy. Jump cutting back after running through all those opponents again, we're on to Duel 2. And I brick my hand. I'm going to set a spell card to try and bait a Harpy's Feather Duster. Which seems to work. Not having anything better in my hand, I'm just going to select everything and hope for the best. At least I'm going to deal some damage to his life points. Fortunately, he only summons a Gate Guardian. But taking the massive gamble here when it's my turn, I'm going to use a Forest just to give myself a little bit more attack power, hoping I can survive at least one more turn. And thankfully, I do. That spell card saved my butt. Big time. Putting our prior knowledge to the ultimate test, if we take out his Gate Guardian, he will not summon a Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Let's just see how that logic fares for the remainder of the duel. So far, so good. Going tit for tat, I think we end up taking this guy down in our next turn. Come on, don't do anything run ending. Yes, we got him. Seto 3 is down and we attack for game. We win, da 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 a key mace. Before we get the chance to set our insects on him, Haishin grabs and attempts to shank Seto. You do you, my dude. With a bio plague imminent, the scream fades to white and we're confronted by the wholesome figure known as Uncle Fungus. Being the charismatic guy that he is, Haishin asks Fungus to cooperate, but due to a translation error, he ends up catching fire instead. Classic Konami. Threatening Fungus with some paper, he becomes enraged and challenges us to a duel. Thankfully, Fungus' deck is a lot weaker than Seto 3's. We only need to summon a monster that's stronger than his media Black Dragon. Aside from that, all he has in his deck is Black Skull Dragon and Blue Eyes White Dragon. As I've said multiple times, avoid using a Jupiter Guardian Star. Attacking his monster with our Dungeon Worm, and then again to his life points, Fungus starts to realize that once you go Worm, that's what you'll yearn. So it's a Raigeki for the win, and we attack for game. Da -da 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 we win a Wicked Dragon with an Osat's head. Before we can unleash our bugs, Fungus peels the lays back and shows us that he has no flesh that can be eaten. To prove a point to this guy, we challenge him again to a duel. Now remember at the start of this when we set our difficulty to hard? Well this is where the game humbles the ever-loving crap out of us. Unfortunately, going by the duel counter in the top left corner, we simply didn't draw the right equip cards to hit over the opponent's Gate Guardian. That 50 attack point difference from Jiraguma really makes the difference. In a last ditch effort, I try and attempt to take out his Black Skull Dragon. I'm at least able to hit over the top of that. My mind was hoping that he'd summon a face down, but that wasn't the case. We get attacked by Gate Guardian, and we lose the duel. So it's all the way back to the friggin' start. <sighs> at least we'll win our second run through. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Summon something weak, summon something weak. Please, please. <sighs> Third time's a charm, I guess. Okay, we're on the back foot. We just need to put something in defense mode and hope that our next hand is enough to beat this guy. I cannot be bothered going back and doing this gauntlet a third time. Please, 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 please. You've got to be freaking kidding me! <sighs> yep, yep, rub it in our faces. Twin-headed Thunder Dragon for the win. By the way, I omitted the amount of times that I lost to Seto 2 on our successive runs. I didn't bother recording, I just rage reset at that point, so... Just know that I lost to him several freaking times in the lead up to this. We beef up our Jiraguma to at least be stronger than a Gate Guardian. Thankfully, it looks like that he summoned down a Media Black, giving ourselves a chance to be stronger than a Blue Eyes Ultimate. I still need to be wary in case this guy drops a Raigeki on us, because that's still a massive possibility. I'm going to try just bait him into attacking my weaker monsters and going tit for tat with chip damage. By the looks of things, that AI mechanic seems to be working, so I highly recommend it. If my math is correct for once, this is our final turn. We attack, and that's Nightmare down. Finally. Finally. No bugs required, this guy blows himself up. Play that victory music because we've earned it. Can you beat Yu-Gi-Oh Forbidden Memories with an insect only deck? Yes. Yes you can. But wait Jono, what about easy mode? What does easy mode look like? Let's hit that rewind button because here's a bonus playthrough for you all. The easy mode for our runs begins on the pocket stations. I say that as plural because we need two of the bloody things. The pocket station has a function called communication fusion. This feature lets you trigger a ritual summon by sending the four required cards to another pocket station. The recipient device will receive the four cards as the combined ritual monster. The stupid thing about this is that the recipient is reaping the entire benefit from this transaction. You end up using four cards and they get the monster. So let's hope your friend plays nice and gives the card back to you. In this example, we're sending a Javelin Beetle Pact, a Hercules Beetle, 
a Kuwagata Alpha and a Quagga Hercules to receive a Javelin Beetle on the other device. I missed the footage for this next one, but we'll be obtaining our perfectly ultimate Great Moth from the infrared function. Here's the card in our library, already at 10 copies, because I duplicated the ever-loving crap out of it. And here is our deck for the easy mode playthrough. I obtained the Great Moth via the same IR communication function, I just forgot to get footage of it, again. Now with this out of the way, let's get to the run. The first duel we have against Sebek should showcase just how devastating a fully powered insect deck can be. I didn't even bother trying to rejig the equip cards with how confident I am in this deck's ability. After seeing how colossally easy this playthrough is, this is most likely how the developers envisioned the game to be played over in Japan. I'd go as far as to say that they made the final 6 difficult on purpose, just to drive up the sales of the pocket station. For those of you wondering how I found out about the Pocket Station's existence, you can thank the Memory Meadow stage in Astro's Playroom. It's on the PS5. The Pocket Station is the collectible you obtain at the end of the rail section in that stage. There's also a special edition black version of the Pocket Station that came bundled with a Japanese copy of Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. Good luck grabbing a sealed copy of that. I've seen eBay auctions going for close to $1,000 for it. One thing I neglected to mention earlier was the materials needed for the Javelin Beetle Pact. One of the cards required is Hercules Beetle, which can only be obtained via Pocket Station. Sorry guys if you're trying to do this legitimately. Through my rambling and information, I've taken out both Sebek and Neku, and it's on to Haishin. I didn't bother trying to edit in all the pest control stuff and references. My playthrough of this would be over sooner than it would take me to sync those pieces back into the video. Getting into more of the mechanics of the Pocket Station, outside of Ritual Monsters, you're able to also use the communication fusion function to combine certain monsters into their required ritual card. Why you do this, I have no idea. Those cards are easily obtainable from the lower mages and the password trader. Information aside, we've taken out Haishin and it's on to Seto 3. And boy oh boy do I have a bone to pick with this guy. Despite not drawing our new insect cards, we have more than enough equips to boost Dragoma to some astronomically stupid attack power levels. There is a cap to both the monster attack power and defense power. Everything caps at 9999. That goes for life points as well. When you attempt to add an equip card to a monster already at that 9999 limit, the animation will occur but no attack point increase will happen. Anywho, we give a big middle finger to Seto 3 and make our way to Dark Knight, who's basically a free duelist because he's much weaker than everyone else we've faced so far. I'm calling it right now, the duel will be over in 3 of my turns. Let's count them off. So first was turn 1. This is now turn 2. We attack with Javelin Beetle and then we attack his life points with Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth. He does nothing in futility. We pop off a Raigeki and attack for game on turn 3. See, I am a wizard. With the screen fading out, we have some much needed payback to dish out to this guy. Comically, with all the effort needed to make a Javelin Beetle, Great Moth outclasses it massively. So if you have a pocket station, don't even bother trying to do the communication fusion. Just try your luck with some remotes and get this card. And I guess the same goes for Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth as well. Getting Nightmare down to his last turn, we attack with Great Moth, he summons something in Futility, and we pop him off with a Crush card because I ran out of Raigeki. Attacking with Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth, Nightmare is down, and we have beaten the game once more with our overpowered insect deck. Play the victory fanfare once again, because I've proven that you definitely can beat the Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories game with an insect deck. Hi everyone, Jono here. Thank you all so much for making it to the end of this video. I hope you liked the bonus run I threw for you all at the end. I mean, let's face it, that was the insect deck you really wanted to see. I want to give a ginormous thank you to everyone who liked and commented on the last Sea Serpent video. It just hit 100,000 views. Safe to say, I'm friggin' speechless. So here's some words to say, you're all amazing people. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to keep updated on when my next video will drop. Be sure to leave your comments below as well on what type you'd like to see next. At the moment, Ritual and Pyro seem to be neck and neck, so get your comments in before I make a start on one of those. Until then, stay awesome people, and I'll see you next time.